بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين Welcome to the class. I hope you guys are all keeping well. Alhamdulillah, we've now finished five out of the ten sessions that we had in mind. So we've finished 25 pages so far. Um, and the goal is to go to about the end of Surah Baqarah, which will be a little bit less than 50 pages. Inshallah, we have another five sessions ahead of us. And so together, inshallah, as much as we can, let's try to read this part of the Holy Quran, think about it, make sure we're understanding. As I keep reiterating, this can't, like at this pace, we can't be expected, we can't have unrealistic expectations that we're going to do a proper tafsir class and explain everything. It's more just to get a surface understanding and, you know, the concepts that are being discussed should be at least at that level that it is discussed in the matan of the Qur'an, in the text of the Qur'an, we want to make sure that it is clear to us. Today, incidentally, in these pages 26 to 30, there are a number of different fiqhi discussions that come up. First, on, on page um, yeah, on page 27, there is a discussion of qisas. And then at the end of page 27, that's, so that's in verses 178 and 179. And then verse 181, 182 is talking about Wasiyat, or maybe even before that, 180, one, yeah, 180, 181, 182 is talking about wasiyat. And then there's a long discussion about fasting. Many of these verses that we're all familiar with every year in the month of Ramadan, we hear these verses. Kutiba alaykum siyamu That comes also in these pages. And then at the very end of this five page, uh, five pages that we're looking at today, which we might not get to, there is a discussion about hajj and some of the rules of hajj. Just for your own interest and for your own, inshallah, benefit, I thought I would make a few points since we have all these different fiqhi chapters that are being discussed. Since we have all these different fiqhi discussions that come up in these pages, I thought I would just spend a few minutes talking a little bit about the subject of fiqh, how the sharia, the fiqh of the Ahlul Bayt has reached us, and then give uh, for barakah like the story of one of the outstanding fuqaha who lived in uh, not our time, but not too long ago either. Sayyid Abu Hassan al Isfahani, somebody who died in the year 1365 Hijra, so about 80 years ago. But yeah, just as a quick overview, basically during the lives of the Imams, uh, the Shia community, the companions, the ulama had already begun to write down the ahadith. And, and one of the main things that was being discussed in the ahadith was the fiqh, was the uh, sharia basically. And so the, you can even say the majority of the ahadith corpus, the hadith corpus that we have, pertains to the study of fiqh. In those days, it was a kind of, it became a, a culture or a pattern that people would compile a hadith in a book that was about one subject, and then they would call it like the book of that subject. So the book of Salat, the book of Taharat, the book of Hajj, the book of Nikah, the book of Wasiyat. Okay? And then in the Ghaybat period, when all of the Ahadith were combined and these huge corpuses of Hadith were uh, compiled, such as Al-Kafi or such as other books, Tahdib, um, then there kind of came about this idea of like one book that encompassed all of the subject of fiqh. And so when people started writing books that was, it was in that period, in the early period of the ghaybat e kubra that also the subject of fiqh became its own independent subject from hadith. So prior, prior to like the 5th century hijrah, there was no really subject of fiqh independent of hadith. If somebody wanted to study fiqh, they would come and quote the hadith that had to do with wudu or nikah or salat. But eventually, especially at the hands of some uh, somebody by the name of Sheikh Al-Tusi, a very, very outstanding figure, he kind of evolved the Shia subject of fiqh such that it became its own independent subject. And the kind of initial system of ijtihad that we have today 
was established by such people where they had all these principles that they had taken from the Ahlul Bayt and the Ahadith and everything and with that system that they had they would be able to give a fatwa on anything any kind of new subject that came up even if we didn't have a Hadith they would have that kind of system of principles that they would fall back upon anyways the idea became that we then later on we had these books of fiqh that were comprehensive that addressed all the different areas of fiqh but they kept that culture where each independent chapter remained kitab like it was within a huge book of fiqh you would have a chapter on namaz that would be called kitab salat or you would have a chapter on nikah that would be called kitab nikah so people might get confused why is it called kitab kitab means book it's only one chapter within a bigger book but it had become a kind of culture of calling the chapter kitab okay so we have about 50 or so there's different divisions but we have about 50 or so different chapters of fiqh that are traditionally uh, discussed one of them would be called the chapter of or the kitab of qisas very much related to qisas is another discussion called diya so that's its own chapter wasiyat is its own chapter Som is its own chapter hajj is its own chapter some of these chapters are very small, like wasiyat is not going to be more than a few pages. But some of them like hajj or taharat or salat or nikah or bay'ah, buying and selling, these are huge, huge chapters that have a very, very lengthy discussions within them. Okay, another point very quickly I thought I'd mention one of the, so we have a lot of great fuqaha who through the centuries have really worked on developing the subject of fiqh and a lot of the main work of the hawza has been in the subject of fiqh today if somebody wants to study in the shia seminary and learn the kind of scholarly way of interacting with the quran and the hadith the way you're going to learn that is by studying fiqh or you definitely won't learn it without studying fiqh. fiqh might be part of the kind of process but it's a very very important part of the process so yeah, in recent times we had a marja who was the head of the Hawza in Najaf, who was an outstanding figure, who was a teacher of many fuqaha and himself an outstanding faqih. Uh, his name was Sayyid Abu al-Hasan al-Isfahani. He was somebody who Ayatollah Bahjad narrates that it's not known if there was anybody who had a memory the way his memory was. He had memorized all of fiqh, including like the derivation of like every small detail he could go and teach their sakharaj without even preparing he had everything memorized there's many amazing stories about him i just thought it's good for us to hear these things to appreciate the sacrifice and the struggle that our ulama have gone to to give us the sharia today the way that we have it so he was from a village in outside of the city of isfahan and at a young age, he really wanted to go and study in the Hawza. He had an attachment to the Qur'an, to the Hadith, and to Islamic studies. And so he, he begged his father, and he got permission from his father to leave the village that they lived in, to go to the city of Isfahan and study in the Hawza. And there's a beautiful story that he went and he lived extremely simply. He lived in the Hawza in a, a famous school called Madrasa Sadr in Isfahan. And, and he lived in a lot of difficulty. There was a time where he had run out of money in the early months when he was studying. He was about 12 years old. He had run out of money. He didn't have proper food. And it was bitter cold. It was the winter. And in that situation, his father came to visit him. And his father, when his father saw the difficulty that he was going through and how much he was struggling, he was really upset. He said, look, I told you that this hawza is not for you. You're too young. You're going to go through these kind of difficulties. Let's, let's go back. Like, pack up. You can't stay here. He didn't have any candles. He didn't have any heat. He didn't have the basics of the food. And in that difficulty of the winter, he was studying in the hawza. When his father insisted that he has to leave, he felt really bad. And he, he, like, he did some tawassu to the 12th imam. And this is like he himself narrates that this incident happened where... Basically, somebody knocked on the door of the Hawza and called him and told him, go and look in this cabinet. There's some candles 
take this money, go buy yourself some coal, heat, like heat up your room, buy some food, and tell your father not to worry. Like you're, you're being taken care of. And when he went and told his father this, his father started crying and realized that that was the 12th Imam that had come. So from a young age, he, he was somebody who went through so much difficulty. Later, he, was, he lived in, in Najaf for probably most of his life. He was the head of the Hawza. He trained many, many Maraja, many Mujtahids. Allama Tabat Tabai, for example, was one of his students. <coughs> and, and many of the like recent Maraja who we had would probably have been his students. He wrote a very important book in fiqh called Wasilat al-Najat. It's a complete, uh, complete kind of book in Ahkam that goes through all of the different chapters in Ahkam. When Imam Khomeini rahmatullah was exiled into Turkey in like the 1960s, first he was in Turkey and then later he was in Najaf, he took this book basically and he modified it to be in line with his own ijtihad. And so Imam Khomeini's book is called Tahrir al-Wasila. It's a very important book in Ahkam today. Uh, people who follow Imam Khomeini or even many other maraja, um, it, because Imam Khomeini's opinions are very often in line with the common opinion of our traditional fuqaha, even other maraja at times will tell people to go and refer to this book. If they don't have certain ahkam, they haven't worked on certain chapters, they'll say, it's okay, go refer to Tahrir al-Wasila, whatever Tahrir has. You can uh, follow that. And so basically Imam Khomeini rewrote this book of Sayyid Abul Hassan and he called it Tahrir al Wasila, And it is a complete kind of course in Ahkam uh, according to Imam Khomeini's opinion. So these are chapters such as uh, Qasas and Diya you will find in Tahrir al Wasila, But you won't find, for example, Ayatollah Sistani's books won't have them. He for some reason has not uh, published this ijtihad of his to do with uh, penal code of Islamic governments and other things to do with Islamic governments as well. Anyways, that was just a few points about fiqh and about Sayyid Abul Hassan al Isfahani. Let's move on now. I, I wanted to give a very quick overview of what is Qisas and Diya and Wasiya, specifically with regards to the verses. The verses are looking more, when it comes to Qisas, the verses we're looking at pertain to qisas in terms of killing, avenging somebody who has murdered another individual. So, very quickly, basically the idea behind dia is that for somebody who, uh, basically dia is money that has to be paid to the family of somebody who has been murdered, okay? So, uh, again, there is other aspects to Qisas and Diya that is not to do with murder that we are not looking at right now. What we are looking at is in the case of when somebody is killed wrongfully, we can have one of three situations. Either they were intentionally killed, or it was totally by mistake, or there's something in the middle. Okay, the something in the middle is like you you are beating the person, but you didn't mean to kill them. Okay, so you didn't intentionally kill them, but you intentionally did something to them that resulted in their being killed. So in the Sharia, in this second situation and in the third situation, the person who was responsible for killing the killed person has to pay dia. Okay, so there is a certain amount of money that basically is, has to be paid. I can tell you what it is in the Sharia and I can tell you what it is in Iran. So in terms of the Sharia, there's a bunch of things that, uh, a bunch of different values. I'll just open it up and then you can show it. So either a hundred camels, you can just see it right here basically, a hundred camels, shutur means camel, or two hundred cows, or one thousand sheep, or two hundred pieces of cloth, like clothing that is of a very expensive Yemeni cloth, 
or a hundred a thousand golden coins or ten thousand silver coins so in the sharia we have to basically or well, this is the way it has been uh, specified that the dia that has to be paid the person who has to pay the dia for a man who was killed has to pay one of these values in iran practically what they charge this year is 600 million tumans which is 25000 canadian dollars approximately 25000 so the idea is somebody who by mistake kills another person they need to pay that dia and even if they they were like in the middle where they did it. It wasn't totally a mistake, but at the same time, it wasn't totally intentional. They also need to pay that dia. However, in the case of an intentional murder, Mr. X has intentionally killed Mr. Z. Here, the asal, like the or the main ruling, is that qisas has to be carried out. But that idea of qisas is that it is the right of the family. So the family of the killed person has that right that they can take revenge and they can have that killer be killed. And so this is the idea that we see in these verses that qisas is uh, uh, what Islam presented as the rule as opposed to, you know, what other systems that were there prior to Islam in the time of Jahiliyyah it would become like when one person was killed, there would be like a war for generations between two different tribes. And if the if like the chief of the tribe decided, they would kill the whole other tribe. Or if they decided, they would just maybe like, you know, ignore the whole killing. There was no system, there was no logic. In in return, in, in as opposed to that, Islam established a system where the family of the killed individual has that right. The default is that they go take revenge, but if they want, they can say... No, we don't want to take revenge. Instead, we will get the dia money. And then in that situation, they can ask for the dia. But if they want to, they can also. Uh, I mean, even if they don't, I think the default is that the qisas will be carried out. Okay, so that was a kind of overview. There's a lot more. There's details of like... Uh, there's differences between, you know... Uh, slaves and free people and men and women and then there's also like the dia and qisas of not just killing but like harming the other individual but we don't have time to go into all of these details so let's leave it at that inshallah let's start now going through the actual ayat of the holy quran from page 26 inshallah reading it and explaining um when we come to wasiyat i'll talk a little bit more about wasiyat then but for now, let's go with the verses of the Quran. Unless you guys have any comments or questions. Or... One question. The, the conversion you explained in Iran that occurred in yeah, the yeah. Canadian dollars, it doesn't match up with some of the other values. Yeah, yeah, there. yeah. So what's the process by which they came from? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's a good question. Um, I don't know exactly how the details work, but you can imagine like they have a lot of mujtahids working for the judicial system there. Uh, like uh, to be a qazi in the sharia, you have to be a mujtahid. I remember like reading about the biography of Ayatollah Hadi Ma'rifat. Ayatollah Hadi Ma'rifat was a very important scholar who wrote books in uh, ulum e quran Some of these books have been translated into English. Um, so uh, he was a student of Imam Khomeini and Ayatollah Khuri. In Najaf, and then later, before the Islamic Revolution, he was exiled from Najaf when Saddam was caught making all the Iranians leave Iraq. In any case, he lived in Iran, and even though his like goal was to work on ulum al Quran, Imam Khomeini told him after the revolution, like we need more mujtahids in this system, like to to be involved in the judicial system, to be a judge, and so for a while he was working for. This judicial system and some of his fiqhi opinions became the law in iran so for example like the custody of a child the majority opinion of many of our fuqaha is that the father has like exclusive custody after two years especially if a boy anyways ayatollah hui and this ayatollah hadi ma'rifat they had a different opinion which is like till seven years the custody is for the mother i think and so that opinion became the law in Iran. I'm just giving you an example to show how like the law in Iran is very much based on the Sharia, 
but they have mujtahids there who are working on it and implementing it and 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 at times maybe it's like you know the opinion of that mujtahid who's the qazi right now or the head of the judicial body of the government and so somehow they've come to this i don't i don't think you have a choice where you can say i'm going to give this many camels or you have to pay 600 million to months so. So starting with verse 170, these are verses to do with the mushrikun and the kuffar. In the previous page, we had discussions about them. So about them, it says that... The English translation. It says that when they are told to follow that which Allah has sent, they say, no, we will continue to follow that which we have found our fathers following. And Allah is like, you know, rhetorical question. Even are you going to follow them if they didn't have any aql, they didn't use their intellect, they were not guided people, are you still going to follow them? So this idea of blindly following is being rebuked in these verses. The next verse gives another parable. I don't know if we mentioned this, but it's an interesting point in Arabic to know that there's a difference between mithal and mathal. So whereas we have in the Qur'an that there is no mithal of Allah, we have on the other hand that there is a mathal of Allah. Apparently the difference is that mithal means that it's something in its essence similar to something else. So we have laysa kamithlihi shay'un about Allah. There is nothing that is similar to Allah. But mathal is this idea of a parable where in one dimension, in its attributes, this thing is similar to that thing. So you're making a parable between these two different things. So here we have a parable of those people who are disbelieving. And the parable is that of like a shepherd who is calling out to animals. Imagine that there are sheep in the desert that are going away from where they're supposed to go. They're going towards danger. They're going towards a wolf who might eat them. And the shepherd is trying to call them. He's shouting at them, come back. But they don't understand. All they hear is noise and it doesn't mean anything to them. So this idea of like hearing and not understanding is being given as a parable for the disbelievers. Okay, and then the next verse again, it's saying that, oh, believers eat that which is halal, give sugar to Allah. And we have such verses in different places in the Quran where it kind of goes through some of the haram uh, food, haram sources of food basically so Allah is saying that mita or the word maita is probably more correct as it's used in the Quran but normally in fiqh we refer, refer to haram meat as mita in the Quran it comes as maita same word basically the idea is that an animal that is not done zabiha of an animal that is slaughtered or killed not in accordance to the sharia is haram to eat Dumb blood is haram to eat. The the meat of a pig is a swine is haram to eat. Wama uhilla bihi Allah. Some animal that has been offered to other than Allah. Faman yadtura ghayra baghin wa la adin fala ithma alayh. The apparent meaning of this, although there are other opinions, but the apparent meaning of this is that it's simply saying that look, these the main rule, the primary rule is this that. You're not allowed to eat pork. You're not allowed to eat amita. You're not allowed to eat blood. But if you're forced to, <coughs> it's okay. So, you know, we have this idea that all of the laws of the sharia under stress and, you know, in a very difficult situation where a normal person is not able to tolerate that difficulty, you can do whatever is haram. And, and like, it's not haram. In that situation, it's not haram for you. So, for example, fasting, we'll see in the upcoming verses as well. Somebody who is not able to fast because of extreme hunger, old age, sickness, they don't have to fast. So, similarly, the idea is here, somebody who is... No problem. Uh, what's the difference between halal and kosher? One. Number two is people living in India, for example. Mm -hmm. What is there to do? Or if I told you more on a trip to India, what is your situation? Right. When it comes to fish, the kosher rulings are the exact same as ours. So it's actually very good to know. You can go to Jewish websites and see the names of fish that are kosher, and those would be the same for us. There is one, one basa 
fetch, which has okay. been promoted quite a bit, okay. which is haram to eat. Okay, okay. okay. There is two bases. Yeah, yeah. So just, just so you know. Right, right. Ahead. The, the common Shia opinion is the same as the Jews in this study. We can only eat fish with scales, basically. Um, uh, the main food, I, I don't know what they do. I don't know their rulings. But, I mean, we have, of course, this idea that you have to make the animal face the qibla and say the name of Allah as you cut the four kind of veins in one go. You have to cut them, not behead the whole thing, but cut those four veins and let the blood go. There's all these criteria. It has to be done by a Muslim these are criteria that we have to make it halal. I, I doubt the Jews have all of these things. In the name of Allah. And it has to be a Muslim who does it. Face the Qibla. Right? So definitely these would be differences. So kosher would not be halal. Yeah. Because I, some, a friend of, uh, a wife's friend called me and she yeah. was asking me. I was kind of taken away. That's why I'm asking. Right, because, right. So what about people going to India? Uh -huh. So going to India, so the living there. Hasan. So many of our marajah, like Ayatollah Sistani, what he would say is that, uh, you know, najasat taharat is like, uh, I think that everybody says this, that something is pak until you are sure it has become najis. Okay? So when it comes to najasat and taharat, it's very easy. Everything is tahir for you until you are sure. Now in fiqh, being sure... Um, has normally what matters to us is like this idea of itminan, that like there's no logical way it could be otherwise. Okay, so if you go to the uh, restaurant or the house of somebody who is not tahir, whose hands are najis, and you know there's no logical way they could have cooked this food without touching it, right? There you now have itminan that that is najis, so you can't eat that. Okay. Um, so this is, of course, based on this idea that Hindus are najis, which is what most of our marajas say. Ayatollah Sistani says that as well. Um, although I've heard that it's a e wajib, I'd need to double check that. I've heard this. I don't think it is, but I don't think I didn't read that in his books. But I don't think. Currently, in, in this part of the world, I have seen lots of Muslim people working in lots of fast food chains, which we. Are commonly down there. What do you do so, so let's say you don't know that they're there. Like th this is where there's a big difference between whether we know it's sabiha versus whether we know it's najis or tahir. When it comes to najasat and taharat, we, as long as there's a chance that it's tahir, we can act as if it's tahir. Let's say you go to a Muslim restaurant, and there is a good chance that you know there's like a Hindu working there or somebody who's najis working there, but you don't know for sure, right? And so in that sense, you don't need to worry about it being najis. However, if you go to the house of a Hindu and you know there's no logical way that it could be cooked, this food, without them touching it, then it's problematic. If, if, if you follow a marja who says that Hindus are najis, it's going to be problematic to eat that food. You cannot eat that food. That said, we have murajit now who are saying that all people are tahir. Even this idea of najasat in the Quran of kuffar, is a spiritual kind of najasat. So if you're doing taqlid of one of those marajah, or we have Ayatollah Nasir Makarim Shirazi, who has something like in the middle, where he says like, when you live in India, don't worry about it, like act as if they're tahir. So we have these opinions, but I think the majority of our marajah till now, they say that uh, mushrikun are najas. But when it comes to zabiha meat here, we can't be like, oh, all meat is is. Zabiha, unless I'm sure. No, here we have to ascertain that it is uh, Zabiha. But one of the ways of ascertaining is if you get it from a Muslim. If even a Sunni Muslim gives you meat, you don't need to question it. You can eat that food, definitely. And the Ahlul Bayt advised us this. We shouldn't like, you know, we shouldn't go beyond what the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt are. The Ahlul Bayt Muslim, would tell, I've heard Mulan Rizvi like emphasize this from the member that the, uh, you know, when you, we can eat, the Sharia allows us to go to any Sunni restaurant and eat their meat and not question, and that is halal. We shouldn't say that, oh, no, it's going to have a spiritual effect on me because if they didn't, you know, really like get it from somebody who's doing it properly. No, but I did what the Sharia told me. I got it from the hand of a Sunni. The Sharia told me that I can eat meat from the hand of a Sunni. So I didn't commit any sin. What affects our heart, what is bad, is when we commit a sin, when we go against the law of Allah. Like in, sorry, uh, in 
and Sunni is usually these people do not mind having mushrik and work it for them and all that. Yeah, so so this is what I've heard from teachers in Qum that like you, even in the times of the Ahlul Bayt, it was not the case that like all the meat in the Muslim bazaar was proper zabiha. There was a lot of people not following the law properly, but still the Imams told the Shia that go and eat from the Sunni bazaar, from the Muslim bazaar. There is no nothing wrong with it. Like that is one of the ways of ascertaining that it is halal. Unless you have again itminan that it's not the case. Let's say you're like, you know, you, you have absolutely no trust in this Sunni and there's no reason for you to like you're sure it's not the case. The interest of time, let's keep going. Yeah, okay, so sorry, this question on the you said mithil was uh, uh, similar in essence. Yeah, yeah. would be similar in... In, sifa, in attributes. So yeah, when it says, غَيْرَ بَاغٍ وَلَا عَادٍ It's just saying somebody who has been forced to eat this haram meat, not out of a kind of... Um, baghi is like, um, you know, zulm, oppression. And adin is to like transgress the rule. Here it's been translated as... Um, without being rebellious or transgressive, then there's no sin upon them. Okay, in the next verse, we have something that we also saw in the previous session about the kind of rebuking and criticizing this these uh, people who were hiding the truth. Apparently, it's a reference to the scholars of the Bani Israel who recognized the truth of the Holy Prophet, but still... But still they kind of hid that and they didn't want to tell people that, oh yeah, this is the person who was foretold in our holy books and scriptures. So Allah is saying that these people, they, they're just like eating the fire of hell. God will not purify them. They've sold, they've bought error for guidance. Like they've sold their guidance and instead they've taken misguidance. Okay, moving on Moving on to the next page, page 27, there's this beautiful verse, again, apparently a reference to the discussion we had last week about the changing of the Qibla. Okay, so in the last week, those brothers and sisters who were not there, we had a lengthy discussion about how the Qibla was changed from Jerusalem to Mecca, and many verses in the beginning of the second Juz were talking about that. So again, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that Piety or goodness, bir is not. It's not just about, or it's not about where you look, looking this way or that way is not that important. What matters is belief in Allah, belief in the hereafter, belief in the angels, the book of Allah, the prophets. At al mal, giving, uh, giving wealth, ala hubbihi. So this ala hubbihi comes in different places in the Quran, and there's two ways we can explain it. Either it means the giving wealth for the love of Allah. So hubbihi would go back to the love of Allah. Or it means despite the love that we have to that wealth. Despite that attachment that a human would naturally have, they still give that wealth in the way of Allah. At al mal ala hubbihi. Who do they give that wealth to? The wil qurba wal yatama. To the relatives, to the poor people, to Ibn al Sabil is like a stranded traveler. Nowadays with like credit cards and stuff, this doesn't happen anymore, I guess. But the idea is that somebody could be rich in their own country, but maybe they've traveled to another land and they're out of money. And so essentially they're a poor person who's lost in like a different city. Was begging for to free slaves. And these are people who establish the prayer. We talked about what that means, aqam as salah Actually, I don't know if we did. I think we did, but it came up in the very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah. The idea is aqam as salah means they establish the prayer, not just praying, but doing it properly or spreading the prayer in society. At al zakah, they give zakat. Wal mufuna bi ahdihim ida ahadu, they fulfill their pledges, their promises when they make a, a pledge. Wal sabirina fil baasa wal darra, they have patience in times of difficulty. These are the people who really are truthful and who are pious. Okay, moving on, the next verse is now referring to this idea of qisas that we spoke about. So it says, O you who have faith, qisas is prescribed for you. Okay, retribution is prescribed for you regarding the slain. 
الحرو بالحروي والعبد بالعبدي والأنثى بالأنثى I didn't want to go into these, some of these like details that are slightly hard maybe for, for people who you know have grown up in the West or for a lot of us to accept but since it's here in the Quran I guess I have to mention it the idea in Qisas and Diya there is this idea that there is a certain Diya that has to be paid for a free man and there is a certain dia that has to be paid for a woman, which is different. And there's a certain dia that has to be paid for a slave. And so when qisas happens, that dia amount is also kept in mind. And so, um, first of all, there are conditions to whether qisas will actually be done or not. Uh, one of the conditions is, for example, if a slave is killed by a free man, qisas will not happen. Okay, this is just one. There's a certain level. A certain things need to be the same between the killer and the killed individual in order for qasas to happen. Otherwise, just dia will happen. If it's one of the conditions is not there, such that qasas will not be carried out, then dia will happen. In addition to that, there is this idea that, like I said, there is a monetary value of dia for a man and for a woman. And so, if a man kills a man. Is very straightforward. The qisas will happen and it's done. There's nothing else. But if a man kills a woman, then because the dia value is different, or if a woman kills a man, because the dia value is different, uh, in a, qisas can be carried out, but the some party might have to pay the other as well. So at times the killer will pay the uh, killed person or money will be taken from the killer before he is himself executed basically okay it's, it's complicated and there's a lot more details and like i said like there's a lot more there but this this is this idea of there is a monetary value and so when it's an a slave who kills a slave or a free man who kills a free man or a woman who kills a woman it's very straightforward their monetary dia value would have been the same so qasas is done end of story whereas if it's not then, then there would be also a payment that kind of has to happen to make sure that the dia is settled and then the qisas can happen if it happens. So that's kind of this idea of a free man for a free man, a slave for a slave, and a female for a female. Now, very beautifully, we see in these verses that on the one hand, it appears Allah is encouraging people to not do qisas and to forgive. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِصَاسِ حَيَاتٌ That at the end of the day, this revenge and giving this right, this prerogative to the killed, the family of the killed, that they are allowed to take revenge on the killer, this is a necessary thing for society. This is a وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِصَاسِ حَيَاتٌ This gives life to society. So first Allah says in, in verse 178, if, if the family of the killed person decides, decides to forgive, and they say, okay, we're not going to take revenge, we're going to demand the blood money instead, then in that situation, both, party, both parties should follow up and they should do their right, basically. فَاتِّبَاعٌ بِالْمَعْرُوفُ وَأَدَاءٌ إِلَيْهِ بِإِحْسَانٍ that means that the family of the killed should follow up with the killer that he pays, but nicely. They should not be too like harsh on him. You know, فَاتِّبَاعٌ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Let the follow-up be honorable, it says in the English. On the other hand, the killer, let him pay with he, and the payment to him be with kindness. So basically, apparently the verse is saying that both parties should keep in mind the other party and you know take care of this monetary debt that they have. In, in, a, in an honorable way, in a kind way. ذَلِكَ تَخْفِيفٌ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ This is a, a, a kind of, uh, what does it say? This is a remission from your Lord and a mercy. And, and فَمَنِ اعْتَدَى بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ فَلَهُ عَذَابٌ so These are kind of, Allah is encouraging people to do this in this nice way. And then whoever transgresses these laws, Allah, there is going to be a painful punishment for them. So apparently... What I read somewhere was that these verses, this end of this verse seems to be saying that it's better to not demand the qisas, not take revenge, and instead pay this blood money. But the next verse, 
categorically says walakum fil qisasi hayatun that in in this part of the sharia in this law of being able to take revenge there is life now that has been interpreted in different ways but one of the natural ways that's there la'allakum tattaqun if you look at this english translation that we're looking at it says that maybe you will be god weary i don't think that that's the best translation looking at the farsi that i have here it says yeah باشد که از ریختن خون مردم بدون دلیل شرعی بپرهیزید The Farsi translation which seems to be better is saying that so that you would beware and you would stop killing one another basically تتقون here doesn't mean have تقوى in like you know alcohol and فحشا here we're talking about killing and murder and so that people hold back and are you know prevented and there is this scare and fear in society that if i murder somebody i will be murdered so that that people stop this uh, you know bad action of murder there is this idea of taking revenge in society and so tattaqun here doesn't just mean any kind of god weariness it means that so that you kind of prevent and are held back from committing this act of murder so that would be the kind of natural translation of this verse that when it says there is life for you in retribution it means that this law of qisas will cause people to think twice before murdering and that will be a source of life and and bring about life in society okay if there's no questions we can move on now to wasiyat basically uh, you all know we have laws in the sharia to do with irth or mirath and this is the idea that when somebody dies their estate is divided amongst their heirs their their children and their spouse and their parents will be the first people who will get uh from their estate however if they don't have any children then it will go to the second tier of like anyways there there is a whole complicated system of earth millionaires we has a, a nice book i'm sure you guys have seen um but there is another concept that is very much related called wasiyat Okay, these are both two different chapters in fiqh. Um, wasiyat is to do with this idea of making a will. It's not always wajib to make a will. If you know that your money and your estate will be divided according to the sharia, and you don't have anything else outstanding, you don't have any debt that will not be paid off, you don't have any qaza, ibadat that will not be taken care of, then you don't need to technically make a wasiyat. But if the wasiyat is going to be the cause of uh, the sharia to be implemented, like let's say you owe somebody money, and if you don't make a will, that money is not going to get paid back, or you have qaza namaz, nobody is going to pray it unless you make a will, or your money is not going to be divided according to the sharia unless you make a will. Okay, in these situations, then it is wajib to make a wasiyat, make a will. It doesn't even have to be written; it can even be verbal. But in in this concept of uh, making a will, we have a musi, which is referred to in the verse, and we have a wasi. Musi is the person who is making the will. The, basically, the person who, when he dies, that will be his estate that we're talking about. Whereas the person that he's telling the the executor of the will, I think that's the English word. The executor of the will is the wasi. It doesn't have to be a child. It can be any trustable, trustworthy individual. can be the executor of the will so in these verses we have an indication to the importance of wasiyat first of all that people should do a wasiyat and second of all we have a, a point in verse number 181 and 182 that to change the will is haram unless there is like a very very important reason for example if the will was not in line with the sharia Okay, so something haram is going to happen if the will is executed the way it was written, or it's going to lead to some kind of war or something like that. It's going to cause some haram, some oppression to happen. In these situations, the wasi is actually allowed to change the will. So that's what we kind of have being referenced to in these verses. I'll just read the verses in the translation. Prescribed for you. when death approaches any of you and he leaves behind any property is that he makes a, make a bequest kutiba alaykum alwasiyatu 
prescribed for you is this bequest or this wasiya for his parents and his relatives in an honorable manner, an obligation on the God weary. Also, I'm sure you guys know this, but just since it's related, when, when somebody dies, two-thirds of their estate is not in their hands. It has to be divided according to the Sharia. Uh, in the opening verses of Surat Nisa, the fourth chapter of the Quran, we have a very detailed discussion of how the two-thirds is divided. And uh, it's not like uh, all of these fiqhi discussions as we're seeing. The Quran, of course, doesn't tell us everything. Many of the very important points are there, but we have to also go to the hadith. And the subject of fiqh is not just based on the Quran. Of course, the majority is from hadith. But anyways, there is this idea of the two-thirds that will automatically be divided amongst the heirs. One-third, the Musi can himself decide what he wants to do. He can give it all to just anybody that he wants to, basically. He doesn't have to even give it to his own heirs. And so that's something that somebody would do in a wasiyat. They would say, okay, I want my one-third to be given to this charity or this cause. But yeah, that was the verse. Um, عَلَى الْمُتَّقِينَ This is an obligation, a right that is incumbent on the people who have taqwa, that they should write a wasiyat. Uh, the next verse is saying this idea of changing it is not allowed. The wasi who has been entrusted with the will the primary rule is that he's not allowed to change that will. Yeah, he's been entrusted. And should anyone alter it after hearing it, its sin shall indeed lie on those who alter it. So this is a sin, this is haram. And the person who has done this tabdeel, this changing of the will, has committed a grave sin. However, the next verse says that there are certain situations where you are allowed to. But should someone fearing deviance or sin on the testator, the testator is the musi, mm -hmm. the person who wrote the will, who made the will, if they fear a sin, then they are allowed to change it. So as I said, like the details of all these things we would have to get from the sharia. We can't, you know, like uh, recently there were all these discussions about, about hijab, right, because of these protests in Iran, and I saw some discussions where people were like, no, it's very simple, la ikraha fid din. We have in the Quran, you can never force anybody. It's not that simple. You know, you can't just pick up a verse and expect that you can be a mujtahid and implement it. There, there's a lot of work that goes into deriving the sharia. And so the details of exactly when somebody can change the will and in what situation would be allowed is something we would have to get from our marja taqlid, from the books of sharia. But this idea is being referred to here in the Quran, that if we are scared of a sin then there are times that we are allowed to change the will. Last week we had talked about Ibrahim السلام, being Hanif. And I mentioned this point that the word Hanif comes from Hanafa, which is the opposite of Janafa. Just an Arabic point. The Janafa means like inclining towards falsehood, whereas Hanafa means inclining towards truth. This is the word that comes in verse 182 is فَمَنْ خَافَ مِنْ مُوسٍ جَنَفًا meaning deviation or basically sin. So there, if there's a fear that this will, the way it was written, will lead to sin, then that can be a license to change it. Okay, in the last few minutes we have, if there's no questions, I'll make a few points about the month of Ramadan um, and these verses about fasting. We're familiar with these verses, I think, from 183 onwards. Uh, o you who believe fasting has been prescribed upon you as it was prescribed on those before you, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may have taqwa. One of the parts of this verse that is, that these verses that is a little bit tricky to understand is exactly what is intended by some of these statements in one, uh, verse 184 about fidya. About fidya and about not having to fast. It seems to be a little bit strange like if you just read the Arabic or the even the translation maybe it seems to be saying that you have an option you can choose to fast if you want or you can choose to give fidya if you want whereas we know that's not the case right like you have to fast what's it talking about so let's let's go through the Arabic line by line and just try to explain it so we're talking about fasting the month of Ramadan Allah says ayyaman ma'adudat 
Okay, this is for certain days that fasting has been prescribed upon you, referring to the month of Ramadan. Then it says, but should any of you be sick or on a journey, then let it be a similar number of other days. So this is the idea of qada. If you didn't fast in the month of Ramadan because you were sick or you were on a journey, then you do the qada. وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ Okay, so يُطِيقُونَهُ comes from this word إِطَاقَة which is different from طَاقَة whereas طَاقَة means strength إِطَاقَة means a lot of difficulty. Okay, so those people who are, it's very difficult for them to fast. That's who we're talking about. الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ means those people who cannot fast. It's very difficult for them to fast. Instead, instead of fasting, they give a fidya. Okay, so this is the idea of fidya that again, we can refer to the books of Ahkam to learn about it. Um, they have to basically give food to a poor person as fidya. And then all of a sudden, this is the Quran is not easy to understand just like that at times. All of a sudden, it's making another point about sunnah fasting. That this idea of fasting that we're talking about, فَمَنْ تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ Should anyone do good of his own accord, that is better for him. تَطَوَّعَ means this idea of like volunteering, choosing to do good. Okay, So apparently the way the fuqaha explain it is that all of a sudden that one sentence is now no longer talking about wajib fasting and fidya. It's just a statement about mustahab fasting is a good thing. وَأَن تَصُومُوا خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ And then again, now this is going back to like this idea of fasting overall is a good thing for you. Okay? I'm, like if you read the Arabic, it seems very confusing here. It seems like, okay, you should be giving fidya, but if you choose to fast instead of fidya, you can do that as well and that's good for you. You see, that's the apparent meaning of the Arabic would mean that, that it's giving you two options. But the fuqaha explain it as the, as if there's no option here. It's talking about two different things. And, and so that's the way the... And so again, that's why I want to emphasize this idea of ijtihad. And we spoke about some maraja in the beginning of the class today. That to, to read the Qur'an, to think about the Qur'an, to take lessons from the Qur'an, that is necessary for every Muslim. But to think that we can look at the Qur'an and derive Allah... Just without studying, without going through the, you know, a hadith and studying for many, many years properly, that, that's, that's not right either. That's not a, the right approach. As you can see, the Quran is not easy to understand at times. Okay, then the next verse is now continuing about the month of Ramadan. This is the month in which the Quran was revealed, a guidance to mankind. So whoever, like, witnesses the month, whoever is there, they enter the month, they must fast. But again, if they are sick or they are on a journey, then you don't need to fast and you do the qada. God wishes ease for you. He doesn't wish difficulty for you. Then at the end of this page, verse 186, there's a very beautiful verse about dua. That whenever my servant asks, إِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي When my servants ask you about me, the Prophet ﷺ has been told that when my servants ask you about me, Tell them that I am indeed near. فَإِنِّي قَرِيب I answer the dua of somebody who does dua when he does dua to me. This is a very beautiful Arabic where again and again Allah is using the first person here. Of himself. He's saying, أُجِيبُ دَعَانِي فَلْيُسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي Sorry. Uh, basically Allah is with a lot of emphasis saying that whenever my servant calls upon me, I, I will answer him. So again, you know, a very beautiful lesson for us to take that there is no such thing as a dua that is not answered. This is an important point for us to realize that if our dua is not being answered, either it is because we're not doing dua properly or it's because God doesn't want this, you know, there's maybe there's some maslahat, there's some good in us not getting this request. And so whatever, and just that, Connection to Allah by asking Him is itself such a huge, huge, uh, you know, important, good thing, perfection that we have attained. And so, anyways, it's, it's, it's a beautiful lesson that's there that categorically Allah says, 
I answer the supplicant's call when he calls me. Okay, we didn't get a chance to go through the last uh, two pages, but inshallah, I, I haven't updated the notes, but alhamdulillah, the notes for Juz 1, they're done now. So like, I mean, obviously they can be edited, probably improved, and maybe in the future, if we get a chance, it would be good to do that. But for now, everything pertaining to Juz 1 that I was going to do for this class has been done. Uh, inshallah, for these pages of Juz number 2, I'll try to be working on it and putting some of these points up on a Google Drive document. Do it if you get a chance to take a look at it, inshallah. I even put a quiz at the end of just one, questions to look at and think about and just make sure that, you know, the points that we've gone through or the points that were there in the document, just test yourself to see if, if you really got them or not, inshallah. Let's leave it at that, inshallah. Sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi tayyibin al that's the sense we're talking for my grandfather and my full, full life